Hey everyone, now I am actually in the middle of recording the video, but this is at the beginning because I forgot to do this in Marshall. But if you're watching this right now, you are watching it on my English language channel. Now, I am gonna to try to do more cultural videos, talking about the United States, visiting the United States, uh, so you can understand a little bit more about American culture, history, and just the way we think and do things here in the United States. Now, wow, I need a haircut. Anyway, uh, I'm only going to put some of this content on my English channel, but if you go to my other channel that I have, which I'll link down below, you can join that where we will, that is a loud truck, where we will be focusing on a lot more things as far as travel, history, culture, and so on. So uh, we're just doing a little trip this time, but next time we're going to do some larger adventures. So go over to that channel, subscribe. Uh, I only have one video up there. Well, actually, technically two. Go ahead and like it. But let's get into today's video on this trip on the National Road. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Marshall, Illinois. Today, we are going to be going on the National Road. It starts all the way out near Baltimore, starts all the way out in Maryland, but it ends in Vandalia, and we're going to start here in Marshall and go all the way to Vandalia. Now, I started here because we have the world's largest gavel in the courthouse behind me. This is the courthouse of Clark County, and this is the county seat. This is where we're gonna start our journey, and you're gonna see that the largest and the tallest thing, this is gonna kind of be a theme throughout our video. So we're gonna start here, we're gonna drive down the old National Road, which is the first publicly financed road by the federal government in the history of the United States. And we're going to see some old things that still remain of that road as well. And one last place we're going to go at the end of our journey when we get to Vandalia is a dying food institution, a restaurant that used to have 700 locations throughout the United States, but now they only have 17. So we're going to go ahead and check that out and see one of the last few types of this restaurant that there is. So all right, let me go ahead and get in my car. We're going to go ahead and explore the National Road and hope you enjoy this journey. All right, so we've come to our first historical structure and it's this right here. This is nearly 200 years old. Now for a lot of you in other countries, that's not a big deal, but it is for us because this right up here, this is the National Highway and this was built in the early, well, maybe more like the mid 1800s. And this structure here was built between 1834 and 1837. And this structure is one of the oldest structures, not just on the National Highway, but as far as infrastructure in the United States. This is the oldest arch along the National Highway, and it's actually technically the oldest bridge in the state of Illinois. So here you're seeing a little bit of history, you don't see this that often. And you don't see things like this that are still used to this day. So it's it's pretty interesting to come across this bit of history that somebody made nearly 200 years ago and is still in use today. So here we are on another part of the National Road. As a matter of fact, this 
is part of the national road that was here over a hundred years ago. This road right here was made in 1918. And as you can see, it is a brick road. It is not an asphalt road. So this road would have brought people from Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York, Richmond, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia, bringing them out west, bringing them to places like St. Louis, Kansas City, maybe then eventually going south to Dallas, Houston, other places. This is history. This is what people actually drove on over a hundred years ago. What is this historic national road? Well, the historic national road, or you know, the national road, is the first federally commissioned road in the United States. That was an interstate road that was to take people out west. It started in Cumberland, or it starts in Cumberland, uh, Maryland, and it goes to Vandalia, Illinois. Now, at that time that the construction was happening, Vandalia was the state capital of Illinois. However, it wasn't planned to stop there. The only reason why it stopped was because there was a depression in the late 1930s, I think 1939, and therefore the government who was funding the project decided to just stop it in Vandalia because at that time it was the state capital of Illinois and that would do, that would be fine. But now, Obviously, we know the United States goes much, much further than Vandalia, Illinois, but this was a logical stop for a lot of people taking this route. And, you know, it was only a little bit of a journey beyond this to go to St. Louis. But yes, this is one of the first routes that the federal government, actually it was the first route the federal government paid for. And this route would take people to St. Louis, Kansas City. Oh, we have, we have a tractor here. This would take people to St. Louis, Kansas City, Des Moines, Iowa, maybe further out to, um, to Denver, to other places in the Rocky Mountains. This would be eventually the road that people would take to go out west to go to San Francisco during the gold rush of the 1940s and the 1950s. So this was a pure lifeline between the east of the United States and the west. It was, it was created only a few years, what, 20 or so years after Lewis and Clark. So even though this road was built in the 1830s, it really was a new road and a lot of it was unchartered area, undiscovered land. And somebody, you know, taking this road at that time, which of course there were no cars at that time, but they would take this road. All of this would be new to a lot of people, especially if you were a settler back in Virginia at the time. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna be driving to Casey, Illinois. And back in Marshall, I showed you the largest gavel in the world. Yeah, Casey takes this whole largest and tallest Thing to like a new extreme. So I'm going to keep driving and I will see you in Casey.
All right, everyone, so we are here in KC and at the world's biggest rocking chair. Now, I, like I told you, KC takes this stuff to an extreme, so we're gonna be going around and looking at a lot of stuff, but um, yeah, let's go ahead and look at this. Let's go around the town and see, see some of the largest of something in the world. All right, let's go. Now I am gonna admit this one kind of perplexes me because apparently this is the world's largest yardstick. Though I thought a yardstick could probably only be a yard. So it <laughs> it comes to the point that it, it kind of loses meaning if it isn't what it is. So if it isn't a yard, how can it then be a yardstick? It's it's pretty funny, but but here you go, the world's uh, biggest, air quotes, yardstick. All right, so here you go, the world's biggest mousetrap. And I'll tell you, there, there's some days that this winter that I thought that I needed this, but uh, yeah, I wonder how, how well this does the job. Now, here is, I guess, the world's largest golf club. And this goes to the point what I was saying about, um, what's it called, what I was talking about when, when I talked about utility. Unless you're Paul Bunyan, no one's gonna be able to hit this. This is like probably never hit a, uh, a golf ball ever. I, I don't know if that would be um, <laughs> useful. It's definitely a driver, maybe a three wood. We can't tell, but here it is. Golf club, just like I said, random, random stuff. Mousetrap, golf club, wind chimes. Let's go up inside the world's largest mailbox. Okay, I will say something I never thought I'd do in my life is to actually walk inside a mailbox, but you know, today's that day. And here we go. And it actually functions as well. So this little thing right here will pull the little door up. So here you go. This is what the world's largest mailbox looks like. Ah, I was wondering about that. Drop mail in slot postage necessary. So. It is technically an actual functioning mailbox. So you can legit call this the world's largest mailbox because it legit sends and receives. I don't know if it receives, but it sends mail. Wow. All right, so I've spent enough time in KC. I'm ready for dinner. Let's go ahead and hit the road to that restaurant that I was telling you about at the beginning of the video. So let's get in the car, get back on the national road and head to what's called Ponderosa. Of course, I was heading out of town, being like, okay, the, the, I've seen all the biggest stuff uh, there is. There's uh, like some things here or there, but I figured, you know, this is it. Nope, biggest pitchfork. So <laughs> this place, at like, like Casey is just littered with all of um, this biggest stuff. But this is something called Pritchard Farm, I believe, and looks pretty nice. Maybe I'll come back here one day and check it out, but uh, we have the world's largest pitchfork. Again, unless you're Paul Bunyan, I don't see how this is useful. World's largest pitchfork. So, uh, all right. Hopefully we don't see anything else that's the largest or the biggest 
uh, in the world because then I'll have to stop and record that because I'm hungry and I want to hit Ponderosa. And of course, as I'm leaving town, we have the world's biggest pizza cutter here. So y you just bump into things left and right. And now I will say one thing, I'm calling bullshit on that. I know there's not a deer that big. I absolutely know that is bullshit. That did not come from a deer that big. But that's legit. That's actually legit. I think that could cut a pizza. So before I go ahead and go eat, I wanted to show you this. Yes, a covered bridge. Now this is not an original, but 117, maybe 190, maybe 200 years ago, there was a bridge here, a covered bridge. And now they had, it, it got decrepit and old. They had to tear it down and this is a reconstruction, but it is really nice reconstruction. And you can actually see the actual highway here. And I'll show you the video of it. Uh, as I was driving by, it's like really old. It's that road that goes through there has to be at least 60, 70, 80 years old and really hasn't had any changes. So these kind of covered bridges you'll find all through the north and the Midwest and, and out east as well in New England and other places. So if you ever get a chance to go and drive into one of these, it's truly an American experience. So let me go ahead and tell you about the concept and about Ponderosa. So Ponderosa, along with its sister restaurant, Bonanza, were cafeteria style steakhouses. So basically you go up to the cash register, you tell them what kind of steak you want, how you want it cooked, and then they bring it out to you. Now on top of that, you could get a salad bar or an entire buffet and add it to it. Now you couldn't really add the salad bar, you had to add the entire buffet. So, um, yeah, you could do that. In their buffet, you could just eat by itself. It has fried chicken, uh, meatloaf, uh, pulled pork, a whole bunch of other things that you could have. And the whole idea was that this was a cafeteria style restaurant. This was very popular back in the 70s, the 80s, 90s, and even going into the 2000s. These were considered the steakhouses to go to because especially back in the 1970s or even the 80s, you either had something like Ponderosa or Bonanza or their rival, which is called Sizzler, or you had high-end steak restaurants. You didn't have anything in between. However, you started getting restaurants that were more in between. You started getting Longhorn Steakhouse, Lone Star Steakhouse, Texas Roadhouse, and, and other uh, restaurants like that as well. And as those restaurants became more popular, it really cut into the market of the cheaper type of steakhouses, such as Ponderosa. And after about 2001, and coincidentally, 2001 was the last time I went to a Ponderosa in Kissimmee in Florida, it just took a nosedive. So they started losing more and more customers. Even though a lot of the places I went to that were Ponderosas were busy, they just weren't getting as much business as they had in the past. So, um, yeah, so that is, that's what happened. It just started, they just started losing more and more and more business. They were, at around the year 2000, 2001, they had about seven hundred locations nationwide. Now they have 17. All right, so the trip is over. The journey is here. I am in Vandalia. Now, uh, I already did a video about Vandalia before. Check that out, or at least it was part of a video I had done before. But now I am here. 
I am at Ponderosa, so I'm gonna go ahead and get something to eat. We're gonna go inside and just, I'll show you around. So, one of the last 17 left in the United States. Went from over 700 locations to now uh, a dying breed, a dying institution. So let's go ahead and go inside, grab some grub. All right, so it's getting a little bit late outside now. It's starting to get dark. And I just left Ponderosa and I decided to make this video. I need to make it now before it gets too dark. But what was my opinion? Well, I would have recorded in there but it would have been a copyright nightmare. Every single song from the 1970s was on the radio just absolutely blaring. It was absolutely packed. There were a lot of people there. It was really busy. I was kind of surprised, especially for Monday. Monday is a day where restaurants in the United States are typically dead. Many of them are closed because it's dead. To tell you the truth, I can kind of see why it's dying. Now, the food tasted really good but the quality of it just wasn't there so I hand my steak I asked for them to cook it medium rare they basically you know the thing was still mooing it it was pretty rare and on top of that there was a lot of fat inside the steak now of course we are talking about Ponderosa we're not talking about going to uh, Charlie's Steakhouse in Orlando, which is one of the top in the nation, or Morton Steakhouse in Chicago. So uh, I, I'm not expecting much quality, but it was a little bit grisly. It just wasn't that great. And like I said, they cooked it incorrectly. So it was pretty much rare. I'd rather them undercook it than overcook it, but it wasn't cooked at a temperature that I wanted. On top of that, the stuff they had in the buffet as far as food, as far as salad and all that, it tasted a little bit stale. So even the lettuce and the salad and some of the other stuff I had, it tasted as if it had been left out for a while, which made the quality of it just go, Pew. yeah. But it was weird because it tasted good, but you could just tell that it had been out way too long if it was fresh and the stuff was just brought out there you could get you could get the sense that it would have tasted better it just didn't it just didn't so the entire damage was 33 dollars for me to eat there so that is a 10 ounce sirloin steak that you saw with a potato the buffet that they have and a diet coke so oh and a four dollar tip so the it it, it was wasn't really too pricey for what you got. It actually was a pretty good deal. Considering if you go to Longhorn Steakhouse or something, it probably would cost you that much just for the steak and a drink, and not including the buffet. But honestly, if you're getting the steak, you don't need to have the buffet. But I wanted to get the buffet to show you guys what the buffet is like. So that was um, one of the priorities of mine. And since I saw the pictures last time of their menu, the prices have gone up so just like everything in the United States and in the world prices are going up so just have to be prepared for that I was going to try and make this you know a travel a history and a food video the food aspect of it really didn't work out that well because of the whole situation that I had with the music at Ponderosa but tell me I, I, I this is my first video like this I want to do more but tell me what you want to see what you want to hear um i i'm brand new at this type of genre to be perfectly honest with you and i'd like to get some tips what do you think is the what what information do you want in these videos what do you want to learn about america because the whole idea about these types of videos is that i want people who are not from the united states to understand the United States, to know the United States, to understand the culture and feel the connection to the country that I do. And of course, you know, something like Ponderosa isn't something that you can personally relate to, but it's something that you can kind of understand maybe how we relate to it by doing a little research and me introducing you to the idea of stuff like food history and whatnot so please let me know 
what do you like this video do you not like this video if you do like it please give it a thumbs up if you don't like it comment below give it a thumbs down i really want to know if this is something that you would want to see all right well that's enough of that for today I will be doing one more video like this. I am going to be going to the DeCoin State Fair and give you an idea what a state fair in the United States is like. That is going to be recorded tomorrow because it's starting to get too late now. But thank you all very much for joining me. I am looking forward to doing the next one. And like I said, next week we'll get back to the English stuff. But I want to try out this genre just to see how it is. And as a matter of fact, if you watch my first video on my channel about travel, one of the bridges that I talked about was just back there. We just passed it. So make sure you watch that one about US 51 going from the crossroads of America up to Bloomington. You might find that interesting as well. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to leave now. Have a good one. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.